Hello, and welcome to Science Insanity. This is a general lore overview of the Inner Sphere. We're going to be covering the basics of human history in the Battletech setting, where all of these space empires came from, where all the fancy sci-fi tech comes from. We're also going to be covering some of the most influential factions, such as the Great Houses, and we're also going to be covering a few random other tidbits to fill out the world's lore, like jump ships, because Battletech has some very unique FTL. We also have a friend along for the ride, so aside from simply covering all the lore basics and having a wonderful time doing it, we're also going to be attempting to educate an absolute science idiot on all of the finer points of nerd culture and hopefully transform him into a turbo nerd just like the rest of us. Hello Steve, introduce yourself. Or uh, I guess at least say hello, your standard. Hello. He is... I'm Steve. He is Steve. He is going to be my test dummy. He knows absolutely nothing about science fiction. He is a bumbling incompetent and has not been initiated into any form of nerd culture whatsoever. So, this entire thing is made to be dumbed down, it's made to be very simple, and we are going to be attempting to teach him all of the wondrous magic that is this science fiction universe. So, we're going to be starting out with the golden era of Battletech. This is 3025. This is basically when all of the mainline canon stuff happens in the game. It's where the most popular era for tabletop gameplay happens. It's where most of the games start out and are set in. It's the most common era in Battletech, and it's basically at the tail end of the Succession Wars, which we will get into. Don't worry to all the other people who have no idea what I'm talking about. And before the clan invasion. So it's Basically the very end of the technological regression period of humanity, and it's when all the fun, shooty, bang, explosion toys begin to come back into the setting. So, let's start with the world of Battletech, because it's fantastic. This is my dream universe, because I am a raging human supremacist. I hate aliens. All of them. They don't deserve to exist. Bomb their worlds back to ash. Battletech is pretty much exclusively human. We threw ourselves into space, just like in the real world, we found a way to punch holes in reality to travel faster than the speed of light, and we began to colonize everything. So unlike stuff like 40k or Star Trek, we are not murdering Xenos or getting into bed with them. Instead, there simply are none. It's good old-fashioned human supremacy. I mean, I, I would get in bed with a Xeno, but that's just me. Um. The, the, only, the only aliens in Battletech are, are weird weird bird people that are still in the Stone Age, way in the ass end of nowhere in the Milky Way galaxy, but the fandom hated them so much that they basically uncanonized them and put them so far away that even if they were ever to recanonize them, they can be like, nah, it'll be like 10,000 years before humanity meets them, it's fine, it doesn't matter. Uh, hey man, I don't judge. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 absolutely not. So... Battletech starts very hot on the heels of the real world. General Battletech history starts at about 2200, 2300, where events and expansion really begin. Basically, that's the first great expansion era of humanity. It's when the Terran hegemony happens, which is basically the United Nations of Earth colonizing everything in their backyard. And it's also when the first exodus happens as well, which is basically when a whole bunch of religious or corporate groups decide, nah man, screw this, I don't want to be here, and just yeet themselves out into the vastness of space, going to start their own little mini empires and cultures way out in the blackness. That's also where most of the great houses and other factions come from, is they're the great, 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 great descendants of those initial voyages out into space. So, basically the second coming of 1492. Pretty pretty much, yeah, that's that's pretty accurate, right? That's where all of the great houses come from, that's where that stuff happens, and this is also where conflict begins in earnest. Because if you're going to go throw yourself out into space, you need the bare minimum of infrastructure to actually get out there, and if you have the bare minimum of, of infrastructure, people are going to follow you. Pirates, mostly. Brigadiers, warlords, in general, you name it. This was probably one of the most violent portions of human history before we get to the Succession Wars, and that's because each little microstate colonized a few worlds here and there, then they started running into other microstates that did the same thing, and everything went tits up immediately. Because humanity is nothing if not determined to blow each other back to the Stone Age with as much high explosive as possible. So this was not a particularly stable time. It's also why a lot of the factions formed, because it was for mutual defense. It's much easier to stop the pirate horde if you're working with four planets of resources than it is with one. Coincidentally, it's also much easier to jump another government if you're doing it with four other guys than by yourself, so... You know, it is what it is. Different reasons for joining together, but still, 
Still, humanity tended to unite in this phase. Now, over several hundred years, most of these smaller factions got obliterated. Like, they just got bodied by the main factions that started to emerge, which later became the Great Houses, either because they were too poor, too militarily weak, too isolated, or in general just not populated enough to resist the encroachment of some of the major factions, which we'll talk about a little bit later. You may wonder, a lot of people ask this question, why, why did they throw themselves so far out into space? Why did it become so easy for all of these microstates to start evolving and, you know, coming into being? when central governments tend to have a really massive hard-on for preventing anyone ever from questioning their judgment and trying to go off to do their own thing. Would you like to venture a guess, Steve? Uh, territories or resources. That's actually a remarkably correct... Wow, I'm actually impressed. Okay, fair enough. I thought you were just gonna oh regurgi... God. Yeah, I thought you were just gonna regurgitate Space is Big back at me and then laugh in the background. Man, I, I thought about it. <laughs> yes, resources is actually one of them. Now... Because of the FTL technology in Battletech, it takes a really long time to travel anywhere. And at this point in human history, nobody had invented the space internet yet, and the space phone was still a few hundred years away. So it was almost impossible to communicate with people on other planets. You had to physically send a ship out there carrying a message, good old Paul Revere style. Guy had to physically run from planet to planet delivering a message, because otherwise it just couldn't happen. The best form of communication humanity had at this point was laser communication, which still takes decades to get to the nearest planet from Earth. What ended up happening was the Terran hegemony, basically all the cultures of Earth that were still in this proto-human empire, were like, okay, we can't do it, I can't deal with this, our uh, territories and our colonies on the very edge of our systems, we cannot get there, it's taking us like literally a year and a half to get from one side to the other, can't happen, not gonna work, we're not giving you no more support, we're not protecting you, we can't deal with this, you're on your own, goodbye. And then they slammed the door and turned the phone, cut the phone lines, and they were just like, you're on your own. A lot of these factions started out relatively, I guess the easiest way to say it is diverse, right? There's a whole, whole diverse group of people. However, over time, they began to consolidate as independent warlords, factions, or ideologies began to take hold. You started to see people who were basically just corporatocracies. The biggest business runs the government, runs our little coalition of planets. You saw ones which are neo-feudal, where someone who claims royal descent basically becomes a de facto king and appoints a noble to watch over each of his planets in his kingdom for him. You see others where warlords basically agree in a tentative relationship while trying to stab each other in the back that maybe we shouldn't kill each other today because those guys are trying to kill us now. And that's basically how you find the different factions and cultures that came to dominate the inner sphere and the different factions at play. And while we've mentioned it multiple times, let's talk about the jump ships. Battletech is, is really unique with the FTL. They, they put a lot of actual science in here and trying to explain how it works. So with your knowledge of science fiction, how, how do you think the FTL works? Just just give me give me a general general overview. How do you think it works? I'm going to say there's some quantum mechanics involved. Um with the engines and um they somehow go through wormholes or some shit i don't know okay you are wrong you, guess you, right there. you are you are so close you are you are so un you are painfully close on the quantum mechanics thing do you want to you want to take another stab in the dark do it's uh you get any schrodinger's theory in there is the ship uh there or is it not or oh my god you're so close so <laughs> The lore, the lore of the jump ships is a little fuzzy because things like travel time, distance, and how the actual jump drives work is a little gray, but for the most part, they basically work off of quantum entanglement. So they basically go, I am here. And then once the jump drive is finished charging, it goes, actually, no, quantum uncertainty, now I'm over there. Unlike most <laughs> FTL, <laughs> yeah, good job. You almost got it, right? So unlike, close. Unlike most FTL, transport in Battletech is functionally instantaneous. There, There is no travel at Faster Than Light. They basically snap their fingers and they go from one area to another. In the actual lore, you find descriptions of how long it takes to travel across the galaxy or how long it takes to travel certain distance. However, most of the time that's related to how long it takes the ship to actually charge its jump drive, which is why I'm kind of working off the assumption based on every representation of them that they just teleport. I did do some math though. 
it's said that it takes an average ship about mm, five minutes to cross an absolutely fucking stupid amount of distance of one light year, which is insane. If the ship was actually moving that fast, it would only take them 14 days to go from one side of the Milky Way galaxy to the other. And human space is not the whole galaxy, it's like a tiny little pinprick. It's only like 2,000 worlds, basically, which is nothing in the grand scheme of the galaxy. If that's the case, let me let me find my stupid number. Let me find the really stupid number. Okay. <clears throat> if these ships actually move, okay, and they don't just teleport like all of the lore suggests, then they would have to be moving at 750 quadrillion meters per second in order to, to meet the speeds and the time frames that the Battletech lore lays out. I mean, seems like a realistic number to me. I mean, I, I don't know, man. Yeah, it's a little stupid. It's, it's what we have now. It's a little ridiculous. It's a little It's a little stupid. You're, you're moving literally hundreds of thousands of times faster than the speed of light. It's, it's ridiculous. So even if they're not teleporting, these things are schmoovin'. They are, they are hauling ass across the universe. But the reason I say that they teleport is because of the way that they work. It's actually very interesting. So jump ships do not inherit any momentum whatsoever when they move. In fact, they are almost entirely relative to whatever gravity well they are jumping into as if they had never even moved in the first place. So think of it like this. The Battletech jump ship is charging in front of a star, right? It needs an enormous amount of energy, so these ships will spend anywhere from weeks to months charging their batteries. When they actually jump, the jump drive will take a few minutes to, uh, to a few hours to fully charge up for the journey, depending on how far it's moving. And then when it finally jumps, you know what, the easiest way to think about it is like this, right? You know you had those um, those little palm things as a kid that had Velcro on it, you could throw a tennis ball back and forth and catch it, right? You remember those toys? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, well, you know what, fuck. I'll put an image up on screen for it. Future editing Canadian, okay. put an Im image up on screen, right? But each gravity well functions like a big patch of Velcro, right? And the jump ship is the tennis ball. When it jumps, it's thrown across the distance of space, and when it hits the other gravity well, it just sticks. It doesn't move. The jump ship is stationary in one system, it jumps, it moves to the next, and it matches the momentum exactly of wherever it jumped to. Why, again, I'm pretty sure it's like some kind of quantum entanglement teleporting, because otherwise that makes absolutely no sense by physics, and it Battletech is, is... Basically has to be. Yeah, Battletech is, is pretty hard sci-fi when it comes to basically everything else, right? So the jump ships are really, really cool. They're insane. I think they're one of the coolest forms of FTL in, in all kinds of science fiction. However, this is Battletech, and techno technological regression is a, is a bit of an issue, a massive issue, in fact, because when you've spent 500 years nuking each other in every possible planet you can, you run into supply chain issues, basically. You, you, you run into issues making new science fiction stuff. So jump ships are extremely difficult to replace. I'm talking like if one of these things gets destroyed, there's a really good chance the system that lost it is not getting a new one for years or maybe decades. They're extremely difficult to build, even for the massive industrial power of humanity in 3025. The good old don't know what the next war is being fought with, but the one after it's being fought with sticks and stones. No, the next war is not being fought. The jump ships are the jump ships are the <laughs> what, what do you mean? The jump ships are the only know, way. Man. It's the only way to travel. Most ships in Battletech you said, cannot you said go the into FTL. Technological regression. Yeah, it is. But the thing is, yeah. it's not it's not quite that bad, right? Because every okay. everyone kind of unanimously agreed Maybe we shouldn't blow up the space taxis, because if we can't build any more of them, we're fucked. We have nothing else. I think they should do it. People almost never attack them and almost never blow them up because they're so hard to repair. Even pirates, they, they generally don't destroy jump ships or even really damage them. Think about it like an old school train robbery. They stop the train and then they board it to rob all the people inside. They don't blow up the train. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean doesn't make sense to they just hamper themselves by doing it so why would they ever commit such things yeah no i think that's i think that's pretty much uh pretty much everything about jump ships it's a really really cool way that it works so now that we've talked about that let's talk about the internet of the, sp the internet what the invention of the, the space the internet phone. we're, we're, we're going to talk about the invention of the space phone and the space internet comstar is it dial up space phones 
going back in time that okay, far? Okay, okay, a little bit. Look, look, okay. <laughs> yes, but no. Okay. Communication in Battletech is done through the HPG network, which was invented a long-ass time ago, and in the modern day, 3025 is pretty much absolutely in its entirety controlled by one organization called Comstar, right? And the reason that it's only one organization and why they have so much power, which we'll get into because they're an absolute joke of a faction, like, they basically control all communication in human space. Like, virtually all of it, except for some super far off in space, deep periphery nations that manage to get away. But those guys don't communicate with the HPG network, they just still communicate by courier, basically. And Comstar... The superior way. Yeah, the superior way. Comstar is basically the space Illuminati. Like, there, there's no other way around that. All of their higher-ups have really weird titles and names. All of them wear these freaky glitter-style robes, and they do some real clandestine shit. Like, they know literally everything about you. They know when you were born. They know what you like. They know your taste in women. They know your social security information. They know what pet you have. They know what your blood type is. They know the easiest way to poison you. They know what your deep, dark fetishes are. They know exactly where you're going to be tomorrow night when you're going out grocery shopping. While the rest of the inner sphere was busy kind of bombing itself into oblivion and the succession wars and stuff were happening, Comstar basically remained perfectly fine. Because they crossed their fingers and went, well, that's fine. I can always take my ball and go home if you guys want to fuck with me. And in this scenario, <laughs> taking their ball is the entire communication network for all of humanity, and going home is leaving them to go back to Paul revering their way across the stars. <laughs> you know, in general, most of the factions leave them well enough alone. They, they're, they're not bothered much. They're, they're left alone quite a bit. But the thing is, they are pseudo-religious, cult-like, corporate crazy people who basically spend all of their time influencing the politics behind the scenes. If any of the major factions trying to kill each other attempt to re-engineer their advanced technology and get back to where humanity was before everything went to shit, Comstar steps in and conveniently makes those people disappear. Because they believe, and they're correct, I'm absolutely calm-pilled, they're fucking right, they believe that if they give humanity all of this technology back, like the big, dumb, stinky apes they are, they're just going to wipe each other out with nuclear weapons and ungodly kinds of destruction. And again, they're correct. To be fair, would most likely happen, yeah. I mean, it, di it did happen. That's why, we're, that's why we are where we are. It gets a little silly because they've been doing it for like 500 years. And after the first or second time, someone who tries to make a peace treaty just mysteriously dies or goes missing or shows up dead because they've been poisoned... You know, fine, whatever, fair enough. That's a little bit of the politicking, okay. But by the 300th time it happens, it should be pretty obvious that someone is fucking with the peace process and you should just go ahead with it anyways because someone really doesn't want it to happen. They're the super space Illuminati. Just like in real life, how the Illuminati are somehow omnipresent everywhere and all-powerful, Comstar actually is in Battletech. Uncounterable, Comstar is the meta. Comstar is the meta. So that's, that's how Comstar rose to power, basically, is they, they pretty much have all control over galactic communication, and they use it to be absolute rat bastards. After a while, all of these big states that were growing out after the first ex uh, great expansion and, like, all of these great houses were starting to be born, well, they were viciously murdering each other, as you tend to do. Except, unfortunately, because there were so many worlds, the idea of mutually assured destruction kind of died because, yeah, I can reduce one planet to glass and dust, but I've got a few hundred more. So why not fling a few nukes when nobody's looking? And then everything went to shit. Basically, the Terran hegemony and all of the successor states got together and were like, man, maybe we shouldn't be killing each other. Maybe peace and prosperity would be better. Also, we can make an absolute shitload of money, and so the Star League was formed. Super Space UN. Another inept organization, or? Sorry, what? You, you said Super Space UN. Another inept organization? Actually, no. No. Here's the funny thing. The Super Space UN <clears throat> is... Who? Okay. I want... <laughs> I... I... Okay, I love the Star League so much, because in the real world, the regular United Nations flaccidly kind of tries to de-escalate conflicts and generally doesn't start any conflicts with other people and all of their major military members kind of just don't listen to them. Uh, in Battletech, 
The Super Space UN starts conflicts and escalates them and won't stop until you've been ground to dust under their boots using their incredible industrial might. They are... They are they are not to be fucked with. Basically, the Virgin UN and then the Chad Super Space UN. Yeah, pretty much. The, the Virgin UN and the Chad Star League... Their first order of business, actually, after signing all the peace accords, after getting all of the great houses and the major factions to work together and electing basically a new king, because the Star League essentially had a king and a council of nobility from all the major factions. After doing that, their first order of business, the first thing that the new unity of humanity for peace and prosperity and advancement did, the first thing that the Super Space UN did was launch a crusade in every single direction to attack every single holdout of humanity that didn't join at the same time. Point in a direction, they're humans, they're not part of the Star League, it's war. Do they happen to be religious too? Or? No, they're not. The Unification Wars were a bit of a disaster. We're not going to get into those because that's like an entire like 50 to 100 year saga of conflict starting, ending, and flaring back up again. So that's that's a long story for another day. But long story short, the Star League basically pummeled everything around it into submission. Yeah, overall, the Star League did a, did a pretty good job of pummeling humanity that wasn't part of it into the dirt. That was, uh, that was entertaining, but under the Star League, humanity was basically reached its zenith. Like, incredible military, economic, medical, and industrial technology that allowed Star League humanity to mass-produce stuff that simply doesn't exist in Battletech anymore. For example, the Warship, right? A general classification for all of your big science fiction spaceships. These ships were self-contained. They could jump at FTL by themselves. They were fully contained warships with the biggest reactors, the most advanced weapons. They could travel the stars alone or in huge battle fleets. They carried drop ships and all kinds of uh, military equipment and stuff, as well as uh, humanitarian aid equipment. Warship could jump over a planet that got cut off from the jump ship network, and it could simply send down supplies if it needed to. They were stunning. And after the Star League, they bombed all the industry and all of the technology that allowed people to build that, so they went away. They died. The only starships that still exist in Battletech in the 3025 era are basically old museum pieces that are still kept afloat by the Great Houses, and very, very rarely, and by very rarely I mean almost never, new ships are made because they're, they're so stupidly expensive and the industry to make them doesn't exist, that it's almost impossible for the great houses to make them. Even building one or two could bankrupt the military budget of the biggest empires in Battletech. So so you're saying there's no U.S. military in this, because they would obviously build one just because. Current so day. here's, here's okay, here's, here's, a good, here, here's a good way to explain it, okay? Okay. Building a warship in Battletech is like the U.S. military in real life trying to build a helicarrier. Could they do it? Yeah, probably. But would it absolutely destroy the country's economy and industry? Yes, absolutely. Okay then. Yeah, it's pretty pretty succinct about why nobody builds them anymore. So those that's basically where humanity is today. The Star League collapsed because of political tomfuckery and disloyalty and backstabbing, as it usually does. And what happened was the Terran hegemony, the quote-unquote king, was a hereditary position, right? The first lord of the Star League. Mm -hmm. um, he died. He had no heirs. There was no one else in the family to take over. And the guy who killed him, who assassinated him, trying for a coup... Uh, firstly, firstly, let me let me go on a little rant. Good old Stefan Amaris. Good old bib-wearing fat-ass little shit. You know what? I gotta find a picture of him. I gotta find a picture. You can, you can basically look at Stefan Amaris and go, damn, that guy is responsible for everything wrong with humanity. <laughs> literally, literally everything. Okay? Like, it's just... <sighs> this guy, okay, came in from a periphery oh. nation. He came in from a periphery nation that got absolutely shafted by the Star League during that reunification war. Okay? He basically worked for most of his life to try to unseat the Star League and imbalance it and stuff, and it he it worked, he did. He killed the First Lord and then sat on the throne. But the problem is, 
he's a bumbling moron because he forgot to deal with the bodyguards and the security before he killed the king. So immediately after taking power, he basically got his ass blasted, and all of the military of the Star League was coming after him. Galactic Civil War. Oh boy. So this man didn't even replace the dictator with another dictator. If he had at least, like, I don't know, replaced the Star League, things probably would have been fine. You know, the nobles would have just sworn fealty to a new king. You know, it's kind of what they do. So after he dies, all of the other great houses basically go like, well, the king is dead. I guess that means I have to be the king now. Like, it's just my duty now, <laughs> right? So you can imagine what happens when a whole bunch of nobles that all think they have to be the next king get into a room together and all unanimously go, I'm the king now. Sure, surely nothing bad will happen. Surely. surely, surely nothing bad will happen. So that's how the Star League collapsed, right? In fighting and civil war, as it happens. That is why they're called the Succession Wars and the Successor States, because they're all the big major players of the Star League that are fighting amongst each other to see who gets to be the new Star League and unite humanity under them. The problem is, the more time goes on, the harder it is for them to unify because the more culturally distinct they become and the more entrenched in their hatred of each other they are. And also, if one state ever looked like they were actually going to gain an advantage, the others would dogpile onto them immediately to push them back down because they're a major threat. So the Battletech universe has basically stagnated with the succession wars for like 500 years. And that brings us to where we are today and we can finally talk about the major factions. So, you ready? Yes. I got... I got this. We're going to start with my favorite faction. I love them. Okay. Right? You know them. You love them. Now, Steve, would you like to be richer than a god and dumber than a brick? Yes. <laughs> would, would you like to look at a problem and say, bury it under the corpses of your battle mechs? Does that sound like a strategy you would like to employ, good sir? I, I see no issue as long as I have the resources available. Yeah. All right, then. May I introduce you to the Lyrian Commonwealth, headed by Noble House Steiner. They are my favorite faction. They are literally the throw money at the problem until it dies faction, and I love them for it. They are great. They are a cultural mix, mostly Germanic. That's the biggest influence because of House Steiner, and because of Steiner's supremacy, that's the de facto culture across the entirety of the successor state. They speak German pretty much everywhere because of fucking course they do. And surprisingly enough, it's not actually a no-no Germany in space from World War II. That was surprising when I learned it the first time. You see, the Lyrian Commonwealth is essentially a corporatocracy. When all of the planets and all of the nobles and stuff were beginning to come together, Steiner and the other noble families decided that fighting amongst each other, power plays, nobility, and all of that garbage is really bad for business, and even though it still happens at the really high levels because you know, you're never going to get away from that, nobility in space and such, they're actually one of the most stable, one of the most free, and one of the safest of all the successor states for a few reasons. Firstly, while Steiner is basically the de facto king, because of course they are, and their ruling noble is the Archon of the Lyrian Commonwealth, they're actually super democratic. Each planet or each region can basically decide how they want to run themselves. The easiest way to think about it is that Steiner and the Lyrian Commonwealth nobility are like the CEOs, but each planet is run kind of like a McDonald's franchise, where they're part of the Lyrian Commonwealth, that's their brand, they gain access to all of the bonuses and all of the economic value that being part of the Commonwealth has, but each manager runs their planet slightly differently. Some of them might be corporate hellscapes, where all the people are basically slaves for heavy industry. Some of them might be democracies, where the entire planet is basically what you would expect from the European Union or North America today. Others are a mix of both. Some of them are split right down the middle with different types of governance. Some are kingdoms, where there is a literal king. But all of them pay their tithe and their resources and work in the betterment of the Lyrian Commonwealth, because they're the branch managers, but they sure as shit can't talk above to their manager and their boss. <laughs> um, sometimes they try. Sometimes they try, and they will always fail, because either Steiner will bring the unrelenting might down upon them of one of the most powerful military-industrial complexes in the Inner Sphere, or Steiner comes by and goes, I'm gonna flatten your entire civilization unless you pay me a shitload of money and shut up and go back to business as usual. 
And that's basically how it works. <laughs> so the Lyrian Commonwealth is super stable because they don't really have the same political infighting on the ground level that most of the other successor states have. They're very stable. There's still unbelievable amounts of politicking and like bullshittery going on at the high levels, but it doesn't really affect the average person. They're also very much not fans of like racism and sexism because that stuff is bad for business. Why would you alienate an entire sector of your populace, which can be good corporate drones and making tons of money? when instead you could just have them working together, you know? So ironically, it's one of the most tolerant as well, despite being descended from Germany. So, you know, I guess anyone can change if given enough time. What the few years in Argentina will do to someone. <laughs> yeah. It is, however, infested by classism. Like I mentioned, even though it's extremely stable at the lower levels, they are extremely unstable at the higher levels because my god, do these corporate asshats and noble nobodies love to buy their way into power. The most common type of general and military officer that Steiner has running their armed forces are some third or fourth in line for the heir or for the throne noble kid that just pounded daddy's bank account, threw it at Steiner and said, I'm a four-star general now, and then he just was. <laughs> and he has all the authority to do whatever he wants with that position. So you can imagine how absolutely awful the Steiner military performs when you have these bumbling morons in charge of it, which kind of counterbalances the fact that if they had a competent military, they would probably just dogpile and destroy all of their neighbors. Because again, most stable, most powerful economy, most powerful industry, and some of the most resource-rich planets in all of human history. And the only thing holding them back is the fact that their leadership is really, really dumb. Like, Imagine there's, uh... pointing a, based on uh, skill instead of money. But uh, when it comes to military tactics, there's a few there's a few hilarious memes that have come out of Steiner, like the Steiner Scout Lance. Generally, when you're doing recon, most of the other great houses will employ some light mechs or some very fast medium mechs, you know, small, fast boys, not a lot of weapons, not a lot of armor, hard to hit, maybe loaded out with some electronic warfare stuff to make them harder to target, and they do their scouting, right? You know, understandable. Okay. Uh, Steiner doesn't. Steiner gives not one shit. If they have the opportunity to deploy their forces, they deploy the heaviest, biggest, most impressive shit they have because they can, and losing it doesn't matter. They can just rebuild it all anyways. So, Steiner goes, no, nah, the easiest way to find out where an enemy position is is to just march a whole bunch of assault mechs directly into the enemy's forces and see where you're getting shot at from. Steiner Scout Lance. Solid plan. I mean, I see nothing wrong. They're fantastic. I love Steiner. They're they're amazing. They are the throw money at the problem till it dies faction and the faction you pick if you're a mercenary. Because since Steiner has so much money, they are perfectly okay with hiring mercenaries at exorbitant prices to do their fighting for them. Which, not a bad idea. Hiring more competent people to fight your battles for you. Moving on counterclockwise, because I hate everyone and I don't like normal clockwise, we're going to go the opposite way because I know it'll make some people mad. We are going to talk yeah, about the normal <laughs> clockwise hater. <laughs> we're going to talk about the Free Worlds League run primarily by House Merrick. Hall, oh, this is the one faction more than any other that I feel like just it shouldn't exist. It shouldn't exist in this universe because they're so unbelievably unstable and incompetent. Do you wish that civil war could be your national sport? Do you look at your fellow countrymen and think, you disagree on how I should get my hair cut and how tall my lawn should be? Die. Not typically, no. Well, you probably wouldn't enjoy being part of the Free Worlds League then, because that's, that's literally what they are. Everyone hates everyone, and there is no political unity in this absolute cluster at all. The Free Worlds League is essentially a turbo-democracy and a turbo-autocracy at the same time. Basically, long story short, all of the planets get a vote in the Free Worlds League as part of a giant parliamentary-style democracy. The reason it's okay. an autocracy mixed in as well is because during crises and military matters, generally one noble group or one person will take on the de facto dictatorship of the entire faction and can control everything at his whim in order to deal with whatever crises is going on. So if they're getting invaded, Merrick might just say, no, you guys are surrendering more of your diplomatic power. We're doing this now. We're not debating about it. We're fully mobilizing now. And over the hundred, hundreds of years of the succession war, slowly the democracy is just 
bled away more and more power as they're just not capable of dealing with issues. And you might think, well, democracies in the real world seem to work pretty well. Well, yeah, because most democracies are culturally one homogenous unit and they might have a few outlying groups here and there. So generally they work pretty okay. It's not, it's not, it's not what it is with the Free Worlds League at all. Oh my god, it's a fucking disaster. So initially, the couple, a couple planets, yeah, it's, it's, oh god, it's so bad. A couple planets join together in order to protect themselves from piracy and local warlords, as most of the other factions did. Steiner basically came together as a bunch of corporate stooges because they're like, hey, hey, more people to trade with, more money, hey, let's go, let's go, hostile, hostile corporate acquisitions, let's go, more money for me, and that's, that's why they came together. The Free Worlds League came together because of democratic values and self-defense, right? Which you'd think would be great. But the problem is, there was originally only like five or seven, seven founding members, right? Depending on how you categorize it and what time span you're looking at. But it's like seven founding members, right? That got votes, okay. that got their votes and seats in parliament based on the taxes that they paid, like the percentage of it. Now, um, that's, that didn't last. In the modern day... The Free Worlds League has over 150 members, and each one gets one vote. But here's the problem. Here's a bit of an issue. Most of those factions, most of those members, only exist because they fought civil wars with their parent nation and split off and rejoined the Free Worlds League. It didn't expand naturally and just encompass more small groups that it brought in. One group would colonize planets, get bigger, get bigger, get bigger, and then it would have multiple civil wars and explode, and then all of those small factions would do the same thing. So you literally cannot win in the Free Worlds League. It literally doesn't matter what you do. Everyone hates everyone in the Free Worlds League. They are all constantly fighting each other. No one can agree on anything. And every single time anything happens, civil war. Getting invaded? Bam. That's a civil war, baby. Let's go. Suffering a massive economic crisis that requires the whole country to pull together? Bam. Three-way civil war. Let's go. So my question is, why would these states want to rejoin what they were just a part of because every time these civil wars happened you got to remember the other successor states that border them are culturally and militarily homogenous titans one or two worlds gets absolutely ram fucked by steiner so they each have their own culture and the free worlds league just gives them a better deal they might hate everybody but at least they're not constantly being invaded for being slightly different they're just you know, fighting civil wars all the time, and often being invaded, but not constantly. <laughs> often instead of constantly. The yeah. little things in life. Yeah, it's little things, right? So it's a slightly better deal, right? The actual economy is super capitalist. And when I mean super capitalist, I mean like almost the very definition of laissez-faire, which worked really well during the Star League because everything was peaceful. But the Free Worlds League never expected the succession wars to last as long as they did because in their mind it was so unprofitable and so destructive that what kind of idiot would fight a war like this you know the mentality of the european empires going into world war one who would ever fight a war when it's so much more profitable to just not terrible regulation terrible monitoring no checks and balances once the succession wars started they realized that the corporate hellscape that they lived in meant their economy basically went down the shitter immediately once the successor states started cutting each other off from trade and, you know, economic cooperation. Merrick realistically only maintains itself because it is one of the most technologically advanced factions. They make some of the most advanced weapons. I was going to say space utilities, but no, space assets. So Merrick focuses really, really heavily on making really efficient, really high-performance laser weaponry or particle projectors or just energy weapons in general. They're also really good at making uh, space fighters, air assets, spaceships, transports, that kind of stuff. They generally spend a lot of their time making weapon orders for other nations. They're, they're kind of like the space US in that the military industrial complex is constantly supporting groups that they're going to go to war with 10 years later because just what do they do? That's just what they do. That's just what it be. So they build weapons and mechs and stuff for Steiner or for the Capellan Confederation or for mercenaries or whatever. And they contract out a lot of their, their industrial potential for that because it's pretty much the only thing that they can do. They basically trade spaceships and energy weapons for other stuff that they can't realistically make. 
because their ability to produce battle mechs, which are like the big thing in this universe for war, they, they just can't do it to anywhere near the same scale that Steiner can or that House Davion can or the Federated Sons. So they basically, they're the arms, they're the energy arms supplier for most of the Inner Sphere. And that's how they keep themselves stable because they just make really good laser weapons. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's pretty much everything we have to go over. The only thing I want to say, I wrote in big bold letters here, their borders are super fluid and honestly, I have to wonder how the fuck they continue to exist. Um, moving on. So, the Capellans. The, uh, the Capellan Confederation under House Liao. Um, ooh, ooh, the Capellans. Oh, God, the Capellans. Where, where do I even begin? Okay, so, to every fan out there for the Capellan Confederation, um, you are wrong. Capellans are the smallest of the successor states and can be described in these most distinctive terms. Capellans do literally everything wrong, they're backstabbing little shits that ruin everything, they exist in the lore to get bodied and laughed at by everyone else, they are literally and figuratively the ass crack of the inner sphere, and I hate them. So, uh, the Capellans, yeah, this has been a PSA brought to you by the Raging Canadian for Science and Thanity. Thank you for listening. This uh, concludes our talk on the Capellan Confederation. There shall be nothing else about them. Goodbye. <laughs> Fair enough to me, I guess. Um... <laughs> it's okay. I, I, I kid. I kid. The Capellans are basically a mishmash of all the worst ideas humanity has ever had thrown together. Just like all the other successor states, they were originally a number of loosely integrated micronations and planets that came together to basically protect against foreign aggression. Particularly because the Free Worlds League and uh, the Federated Sons, their neighbors, were very eager to send quote-unquote peacekeeping operations, read invasions, into their space to slap the shit out of them. Because honestly, they couldn't really do anything about it. And why not? They deserved it. So, they joined together to form the Capellan Confederation. However, they're not actually... Oh god, how do I even explain this? It's like, imagine North Korea on steroids, times 100, but in space. And that's basically the Capellans. <laughs> okay, that's, that's certainly an image. Um, is this uh, Stalin sending the people to Siberia to eat each other type, type beat, or...? Uh, yes, this is all, okay. th this is that also, bad. yeah, this is also the, nobody is technically allowed to have children. If you have kids, they are officially the property of the state, and you are on loan to raise them until they're adults, where they, again, become property of the state. Fully property of the state? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. The state can just come uh, in and be like, you're not their parents anymore because we don't like you. The next door neighbors are their parents now, and that's just... <laughs> That's just perfectly fine. That's just perfectly normal. During the Star League, things went pretty okay for them, and they were actually way bigger than they are now. They were like double the size, and things d d did not go well after that. As you can tell by the fact that they're about half the girth they used to be, things went very not well after the collapse of the Star League. As the Succession Wars started, they basically scooped up a bunch of Terran hegemony land. Or that was basically all the worlds around Earth that formed the original, like, united humanity before all of the great houses rose to prominence. They faced okay. basically no military opposition because by this point, the Terran hegemony was the Star League. And after the collapse of the Star League, the Terran hegemony basically exploded as well. Unfortunately for them... After they made all their conquests, and they were busy pounding themselves on the chest and giving themselves a good pat on the back and being like, damn, we're the greatest, we're awesome, we're the best successor state, they immediately got bodied by House Davion. Like, immediately. They got run over by a steamroller when they weren't looking. This is like a good old-fashioned redneck pickup truck running over a deer level of bodied, okay? They got smashed. <laughs> The train coming through the cow. <laughs> the, the train coming through the cow, yeah. House Davion smashed them so bad, they took dozens of worlds off of them and forced them to sign absolutely humiliating treaties, basically allowing Davion to put a whole bunch of their military in their space, take over a whole bunch of their economy, pay reparations for the war that they were on the defensive end of. Just an absolute kick in the nuts for the Capellans, right? And the only reason that the Federated Sons stopped their invasion is because the Draconis Combine, their other neighbor, 
was more important and required more of their attention. So the Capellans didn't even survive because they earned it. They survived because they're so goddamn pathetic they weren't worth the time and effort when other more important enemies needed to be dealt with. And this is like a um, Asian Asian faction, right? Like Japanese or something? Mm, they're, they're pseudo-Asian, right? They're all okay. of the, So all of the great houses are super diverse. You, you have <laughs> cultural backgrounds from the ruling nobles, right? Like each faction has... Their, their roots on Earth of where they came from, but they're all very diverse, right? It's just the overarching governance and culture that they have comes from, like, one archetype back on Earth. I was just going to go with the old history repeats itself. <laughs> yeah, history history repeats itself, right? Uh, believe it or not, in the future, there actually is a North and South Capella as well. That happens. They get, they get split in half, so, you know... <laughs> started dying in the middle of that in 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 i think it was like the last succession war or one of the last succession wars or something uh after the clan invasion there was an alliance between house steiner and house davion house davion is the biggest faction we'll get to them in a little bit and steiner is the wealthiest faction with the most industry right so when they combined into the federated commonwealth they were like Damn, we're hot shit. We are now the biggest faction, trademark, and the most powerful by, like, an absolute enormous amount. As the two nobles were getting married, because that's that's how you cement political alliance in this universe, you know, as you do. Has been since the beginning of time, man. I mean, tradition. Get, get married and have five kids, please. <laughs> when When they got married, the fucking groom gave, like, presents and this beautiful cake to his wife, and he was like, My beloved, aside from these simple morsels, I give to you the Capellan Confederation. And they invaded the Capellans and bodied them. Half of their territory, <laughs> gone. Most of their industry, gone. Most of their population, gone. They almost lost their throne world of Capella. They almost lost their namesake world to this invasion. They just, oh god, the, the Capellans just get, they get shafted in the lore. Their entire purpose is to get shafted. So the Capellans are basically turbo North Korea, right? As I said, everything is centrally planned by the government from farming and industry to education and even stuff like art and literature and music. If you want to write a book, the government is going to come in and be your editor to make sure you're writing what is appropriate to be, to be seen by their society. The amount of control, literally 1984. Yeah, the amount of control they have is insane. And in fact, their government ranges from actually amazing if they're on the ball because they react immediately and super effectively to everything from invasions to economic shocks to diseases and plagues or natural disasters. Like they react immediately and they can provide some of the best service and quality of life in the entire inner sphere. The problem is, when the leadership is not on the ball... It, it don't be on the ball. <laughs> yeah, it don't be on the ball. You've fallen off and broken your knees, right? It is uh, it is not good. The Capellans also have a fantastic military. And this is why I think a lot of people really like the Capellans. Because they're so small and so scrappy that they basically have to be better than their opponent. Their tactics, their combined arms warfare, the small highly motivated, highly effective tactics that individual units may use in battle lends them to being one of the most effective combat forces in the entire inner sphere. Like, they're they're really good at war. But the problem is, despite the fact that they're super competent and super flexible, they're hilariously undergunned. They have to be that good just to get bodied slowly. If they were incompetent at all, they would cease to exist, like, 300 years ago. They would have just been destroyed. And that's because they have very little industry. As you can see by the map, they are a very small faction. <laughs> they are super spread out lengthwise, which means it's very difficult to concentrate their force anywhere when they are threatened from so many different angles. And they don't really have an ability to interact for economic reasons with the other factions because everyone else hates the Capellans. Their, their biggest thing is they're backstabbing underhanded little shits. If you're ever wondering why somebody important got poisoned, why a contract or a treaty or whatever fell through, if you've ever been stabbed in the back, it's like it's like a 90% chance that it's the Capellans. Granted, Comstar is doing it across the entirety of human space, but Capella does it around its surroundings. Everybody hates them. 
They have fought the Free Worlds League like 15 times over the same three friggin' planets. The Capellans invade, take it, then they get their ass beat and the, and the Free Worlds League takes it back. Then the Capellans invade again and it just keeps happening. And every time they try to destabilize and cause civil wars within the Free Worlds League or cause infighting between the other factions and just everyone hates them. So they have basically no ability to actually trade with the people around them. Everybody hates them. Nobody would give them a rock, much less a gun. I mean, to be fair, from what I've heard, they, they probably are successful in starting those civil wars, though. Oh, yeah, they are very successful. <laughs> yes, it, it works quite a bit. The, uh, the Capellan regions of the Free Worlds League have a tendency to start civil wars of independence very frequently, which, you know, you can probably guess why. Because of all of this, the Capellans are basically locked into only using the lightest of equipment. They love their fast, agile aircraft. They love their long-range artillery, mostly because they're the hardest to destroy and they don't have to replace them too much. And they use mass formations of light mechs. So a medium mech will destroy a light mech, a heavy mech will destroy a medium mech, and an assault mech will basically T-pose on everything else because they're the biggest and most powerful but they're slow. So the Capellans use a lot of light mechs and a lot of very fast medium mechs in order to try to outmaneuver their enemy and outfight them rather than simply beating them in a straight up gun duel because they're never gonna win. So they try to bring as many small dudes as possible and occupy strategic territory and kind of force the enemy into crossfires and that's their whole the, military The Spartans strategy. of the time, but without the... Uh actual armor to it yeah pretty much unfortunately the downside of this is this works amazing when they're on the defensive or if they outnumber their opponent but if their opponent outnumbers them or if the opponent is on the defensive and the capellans have to come to them they get slaughtered another common meme is that house davion generals just sitting on the top of a hill smoking a cigar while the sound of autocannon fire all around him. And he's just laughing as he's watching hordes of Capellan light mechs getting gunned down as they try to charge his position again and again. Uh, so yeah, the Capellans. Hate them. They suck. When the Federated Commonwealth formed, like I said, they had to fight a bigger, better enemy. They got unbelievably shafted. Say goodbye to most of it. Hate them. Don't deserve to exist. Moving on from that, next one up, the Yellow Boys. So, Steve. Would you perhaps, as a counter to the Capellans, like being honorable? Are you an insufferable tool that likes to think of themselves as the trademark good guy? Are you just as prone to civil war as the Free Worlds League, but never get screwed over for it because it is in the noble tradition of the duo? I mean, I'm, I'm on board with everything except for the honorable part. <laughs> <laughs> then boy, do I have a faction for you. The Federated Sons led by House Davion. Descended, oh, I can't, oh, sorry, I'm about to throw up a little bit. <laughs> Descended from the powerful and elite of French and British origin. Oh, the, God. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the two enemies turned lovers, turned partners, started the greatest successor state by pure girth and size, just like their imperial roots. Like the most prior states we've covered, they were originally a number of worlds that joined together for self-defense and trade benefits, but this unique flavor of the Federated Sons is that they are very honorable. They like to think of themselves as protecting rights and freedoms and protecting the little guy. They like to think of themselves as like defenders of the innocent and punishers of transgressions and disloyalty and dishonesty, so they really don't like the Capellans. Another, their unique flavor as well is when they joined together, it was to protect each other from pirates and to basically try to give each other as best a quality of life as they can. Now, each of them, the way that the Federated Sons is set up, each march, because that's what they're called, each like duchy and dukedom is called a march, M-A-R-C-H, right? It's a, okay. uh, yeah. So they're divided up into like little noble kingdoms with semi-independent ruling noble families that control, you know, we're just gonna call them duchies, whatever, that control these duchies, right? They have de facto control over their entire nation and then they will subdivide their authority into lesser nobles to control independent planets or smaller tracts of space. It's like the good old classic nobility pyramid scheme with the king or queen, or in this case, the first prince right at the top, 
and then his board, his directory of nobles, the council, the privy council as it's called, because of course it was, thank you, French and British influence. Now, even though there have been a lot of civil wars in the Federated Sons, they do not play out the same way that the Free Worlds League does. And the reason for this is because in most cases, they have their, their noble code of honor, they have their chivalry, and wars between Federated Sons members are less violent and can often be decided by duel. There was a famous example where after a massive war with the Draconis Combine, the Federated Sons wanted as a whole to help rebuilding one of the marches, one of the um, duchies, right? And they were like, no, fuck off. We want nothing to do with the rest of you. We're, we're doing it ourselves. We're still loyal, but we're doing it ourselves. Piss off. The others didn't like this because they were just trying to help. You know, they insulted their honor, blah, 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 whatever. They had a war. They fought each other over one world for like a month or something. And then the leaders of both sides had a duel. One of them died. And that was the end of the Civil War. So they start just as frequently as the Free Worlds League, but they're nowhere near as destructive. And they end often very quickly with the death of one guy. They fight honor duels like that. Kind of the best way to do it if you're going to do it. I mean, yeah, they don't they don't end up burning down worlds over it. Like sometimes it's, uh, big civil wars still happen, but they're, they're far more stable. However, to go along with the biggest girth and why these conflicts happen so often, the Federated Sons also have the largest military. They are the beefiest of the successor states in terms of pure raw power. And when they thrust into Capella every time, man, do they thrust hard. The reason for this is they are super heavy into military culture and history. Just like the nobles of old, they love their knights and their, their noble wars, right? And in order to be a noble or to become a first prince or to get political power, you have to serve in the military. And because you have to serve in the military, all of these nobles have a vested interest in making sure the military is as good as possible so they're not just thrown to their death. The Federated Sons has one of the best militaries. Like the Capellans are like probably the best tactics and fighting wise, but the Federated Sons are very close second because they have an incredibly strong sense of shared unity, honor, purpose, and soldierly brotherhood. Their, their cultural, like, honor and the way that they look out for the little guy, people genuinely believe in that. There's a lot of loyalty to the ideals and the nation and the idea of the Federated Sons, so the military fights really hard, and they will fight really well because of it. Seems kind of simplish if you ask me, just saying. It is, it is, it is what it do be like, but whatever, it's fine, right? Um, most of the other great houses, though, I don't actually have anywhere close to this like the federated sons is one of the only ones that has like a dedicated faction-wide military a professional standing army right a lot of the other ones including steiner and the draconis combine and stuff their armies are basically controlled by warlords like smaller groups that have access to the industrial power of their their major successor state and while all of them do are like they are loyal and they will listen to the main government of their their super state Often, they'll do their own thing. They'll go to war on their own, they'll conduct, you know, operations on their own, they'll even fight and skirmish with each other sometimes because they compete over what resources are available and stuff. Uh, that happens a lot in the Capellans, by the way, all the time. But the Federated Sons generally don't. Their, their entire culture is far more like what you would see of the US military. A lot of the different groups and sub-factions compete with each other and they don't like each other much, right? but all of them pull in one direction together whenever it's needed of them. Like the other successor states are like Imperial Japan, right? Where the Navy and the Army that's, and the Air Force- That's a comparison I was gonna make. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like they're, they're constantly fighting each other and pulling in opposite directions. So that makes them very scary. Their economy and industry is actually comparable to Steiner in scale. Like their sheer girth giving them insane wealth, ridiculous population and industry potential but they don't really have the potential to use it because unlike Steiner, they're not really fans of super huge unrestricted mega corporations. And instead they focus a lot on small business, local economies and like individual worlds and bettering them rather than allowing mega corporations to fully exploit all of the resources. So it's less effective, less efficient and way less productive. And it's also slow. They often have a hard time getting resources and their economic strength to bear when they need it to. 
but the average quality of life for individual people and the opportunity to make a better life for yourself is the most apparent in the Federated Sons. Big corporations still control a lot of Federation politics, like basically modern America levels of corruption, right? But not quite as widespread. But for the most part, yeah, they're much more open. They're pretty good, actually. They they sort of live up to their good guy mentality, which is why everyone hates them, because they're so holier than thou. Shut up. I already hate them, man. <laughs> I already hate them. Too honorable. <laughs> Can't do it. Too honorable? Oh, if you don't like honor, you're going to hate the next guys we come up against. Get out um, of here with that yeah. stuff. <laughs> their, their industry is also incredibly impressive. They're one of the most widespread industrial survival compared to the other successor states from the Star League. They produce most, if not all, of their military equipment domestically, and they have a huge wide range of stuff across multiple worlds, from light and medium mechs to heavy and assault mechs. They make laser weapons, missile weapons, artillery, like auto cannons. They make everything. They're fully self-sufficient. As such, now that I can respect. Oh, of course, man. They make they make goddamn <laughs> everything. Even aerospace assets. They make a lot of that stuff for themselves. Although they really really love their auto cannons. The Federated Sons will slap automatic naval guns onto literally anything that they can. What's that? A 150 millimeter rotary auto cannon? Absolutely slap that shit onto my battle mech. Let's go. They really <laughs> like them and I can respect that. Heavy artillery is the name of their game. So yeah. Starting to like them a little bit more now. Yeah. I mean, Federated Sons, overall, not the not the best of guys, not the good guys, but arguably the least dickish of the factions and the one willing to listen to a peace deal from Steiner. And uh, last but not least, we got the final one, right? Do you like okay. honor, but not the same kind no. of honor, the toxic honor, right? Are yes. you are you interested in becoming a feudal warlord and governing with a blood-stained battle mech fist? Do you want to execute and torture mercenaries for daring to be so dishonorable as not fighting with your life and dying for the glory of the emperor? I, I'm I'm in. I'm in on this one. <laughs> then boy howdy, you'll love the Draconis Combine. And if you don't, you better commit Sudoku and plunge that pen directly into your throat. Otherwise, they're coming for you regardless. Unlike the other successor states, the initial worlds that joined together to form the Draconis Combine didn't join for protection and economic integration from other people. They were uh, steamrollered and conquered, and the general philosophy of the reason we joined together isn't to protect ourselves from you, it's because jumping you is a lot easier when there's five other guys behind me willing to help. And that's their, <laughs> that's their entire ethos. They are the toxic definition of manif American Manifest Destiny with Japanese imperialism, baby. The entire human space, all of it, every single piece, is destined to be the Draconis Combine. We are the greatest people to ever rule in this universe, and we are the chosen of fate. They are hilariously militaristic, like, to a laughable degree. And they have this saying, as goes the military, so goes the Combine. Just like Imperial Japan, the military is like is the de facto government and allocates resources as it see fits. It creates monitors and utilizes industry and business as it sees fit. And it basically has an iron fist over everything that it deems even marginally important to the running of its military, right? It's, it's nuts. If it makes anything, if literally anything is done by a corporation or a business or individual that could feasibly impact the military industrial complex, bam, state run, monitored. If Tojo sitting in his backyard making pig iron in a random smelter furnace could potentially be useful, then they are gonna send a bunch of inspectors over there to make sure he does it the goddamn right way. How it should be. How it should be. <laughs> they're they're also super stratified. Like they are they are the most class heavy of all the different all the different factions. Like even the Capellans you are not a citizen until you prove that you're worth being a citizen, but once you are, you gain all the benefits of it, right? And, and you're treated as valuable, you're treated like an asset. In the Draconis Combine, if you are not the top class, the nobility, the second class, the warrior, then you're dirt. The middle class of like engineers, artists, scientists, etc., they're considered expendable. They are considered like only useful so far as they can support the military. And finally, the peasants, the farmers, the miners, the industrial workers, they are literally livestock. 
like they will be thrown to their death en masse as poor fucking infantry on the battlefield of the 31st millennium, they will be sent to go fight battle mechs with a rifle and a hand grenade and just that class basically just serves as fodder to keep the warrior noble class going. <laughs> Sounds like they're just some good old 11 Bravo boys to me. I mean, who wouldn't want to go out there with just a rifle and stuff and fight battle mechs that you won't be able to damage? Literally anybody with half a brain. It goes about as well as you would expect. Oh, I'm in the minority on this? <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel, I feel like you might be in the minority on this. I don't know. Does anyone else think it would be a oh. good idea to run to their death? <laughs> Please let us know in the comments. Like, battle, battle mechs are able to punch things, but I don't think I would want to get into a boxing fight with one as just a dude. I, I don't know, man. I've seen real steel. <laughs> I think I could get in there and win. Yeah, I highly doubt that. I highly doubt that. Regardless, though, so despite the fact that the Draconis Combine has an extremely powerful military, arguably the most powerful in the entire setting, but we'll, we'll get to, like, the caveats behind that in a second... Um, their economy is trash. Like, absolute garbage tier bottom of the barrel. They are extremely resource poor outside of just raw manpower because, you know, like China and Japan in space. So, of course, many people, many rice farmers, many peasants to throw to their deaths. And they also have a lot of trouble exerting their resources due to all of their neighbors hating them. A lot. They are overbearing and extremely aggressive, so they generally don't have a lot of uh, success trading with their other successor states. They also can win basically any battle. When I told you that they were like the most militarily powerful, they are in a straight up fight because the Draconis Combine can basically throw so much force and so much professional military resources right behind that initial punch they can win basically any fight with anyone right off the bat. Unfortunately, because their industry and economy is shit and they have almost no resources, if they don't win very quickly, or if the enemy that they're fighting turns it into a war of attrition, they cannot replace losses. They basically have to win in that first knockout blow or they are going to get screwed. Ah, uh, yes, the old Japanese method of decisive victory. They, they really hate Steiner because Steiner is the antithesis of everything that they are. They have like this super rigid loyalty and like devotion to their nation and their emperor and their pseudo-religious view on honor and stuff, right? And so they go to war with Steiner and Steiner is just like, it would be a shame if I were to drop a million heavy mech directly on top of your forehead, yeah? It'd be a shame if I were to invade like 15 of your worlds all at once, yeah? And then the Draconis Combine just gets shit wrecked because it can't, it can't stand against the industrial might of Steiner and it can't stand against the, the raw size of the, the Federated Sons. They are super aggressive, but they don't really win very much because they're not super, they're not super capable of winning in long drawn out battles. And when the battle has been so long and drawn out that it's been going on for 500 years, they're not doing a great job. That, yeah, that's typically uh, considered long and drawn out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it sucks, right? Um, they also hate mercenaries. They despise them. The Draconis Combine has gone back and forth between using mercenaries very sparingly, but hating them when they really, really need to because they're getting their ass beat. Um, and in that case, they use mercenaries to like for suicide missions or to hold, you know, back lines or whatever where it's not important, either to mm -hmm. pay them really shit money that they don't have to pay them like hazard pay for fighting or they hope that they get into such a conflict that they just all get wiped out and they don't have to pay them, right? Uh, and when they're not using mercenaries like that, they are just outright killing them. Like, mercenaries just get executed in the Draconis Combine. They just, they just hate them. They hate them with a fiery passion, right? They see them as dishonorable animals. They are super hilariously overarmed in everything from like their industry to their defenses and stuff and their their entire philosophy is that initial defensive or uh, offensive blow that one decisive kill right and as such their entire military is designed around that their light mechs and heavy mechs because they don't they don't really believe in using medium mechs they think that they don't do anything good enough to warrant doing it so they use primarily light and heavy mechs with a few assault mechs here and there. Your, your average light mech might have like maybe a, a medium laser or two and then a couple machine guns. 
the Draconis mm -hmm. Combine goes six lasers and a whole bunch of short-range missiles bolted all onto the light mech. <laughs> the American style? <laughs> yeah, they're like, I am literally cooking myself to death with the heat generated by my weapons, but if I can murder the enemy before I explode, then it's fine. Piloting a microwave is perfectly fine and honorable. This is the way, right? <laughs> literally, literally the nature of their military. So their their military is super overarmed, and uh, yeah, I think that's probably about where we should uh, we should end it. Basic history of the Inner Sphere, basic overview of all the main successor states, and uh, a little bit of tidbits here and there. We've been going for almost two hours, oh my god, so probably a good time to end the recording and allow me to go edit stuff. So, yeah, that's the end of the video, podcast thing. Regardless, if you want to see my main channel, which is The Raging Canadian, the link is in the description down below, and you want to experience some science fiction-y stuff, want to watch me play some video games and show up for streams every now and again, that's the channel that you go to. I hope you enjoyed it, I hope you've had a wonderful day, goodbye! Stay tuned, though, because in a week or two, we're going to be doing battle mechs. We're going to be going over the titular vehicles of the entire setting, what the entire thing is based around, and what everybody knows about Battletech. Big, stompy, stupid robots.